Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. It's good to see you all. I'm looking forward to doing a little bit of a show and tell and some things that I wanted to give you a chance to be thinking about. Um, but let's go in and open up in prayer and then I'll start to give you a sense of what we'll cover today. So dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the chance to be working with each of the students in this course, Lord. Pray that you would help them to understand the material that we're covering, give them the motivation to work through the things that we're doing in the various assignments, Lord, and I pray that they can have that be an enjoyable experience. Also continue to help them with their spiritual formation, Lord, having a chance to be getting to know scripture, getting to know the theological concepts in which we want to be guiding our life by and giving them interesting and creative ways for doing faith integration as they go forward from here. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. Okay, well, um, once again, I apologize for, for last late week that things weren't um, working that well with my router. Just got this um, amazing router, and it's flawlessly working for everything that I was hoping to be able to do, so that's kind of cool. Um, if I can weave some of those thoughts into our class, I'll give you a little bit of an idea of what that is like. So what I was hoping to do was to touch on each of the three projects that we're working on. And since I'm sharing my screen with these um, slides, I'll just um, take a minute to, to go to our table of contents to give you um, a sense of where we are at. So with the... Um, arithmetic and logic, this is where we're encountering the digital logic. And so we're with our project work, we're getting a chance to see this a little bit early, but you can see how that um, works. In the instruction set and assembly language, this is where we're going to be touching the, the things that we're doing with you getting a, a chance to see what assembly language is like. And we'll be using an ARM processor using the, the Mars MIPS emulator that I've already showed you. And I'll uh, give you another sense to be thinking about that here. And then when we, this next section, the, the central processing unit, when we talk about um, um, various ways of doing, dealing with instructions and actually implementing it, I think you'll see some other ways of how this will fit in with the, the Arduino work that we'll be doing. So we have been talking about memory and so we talked about the benefit of cache as an example of something that isn't exactly intuitive. Even before that, one of the things I was fascinated by is just this idea of a strategy, PCIe, where you have a, a, a quote, dedicated point-to-point -point connection that can then be um, um, rerouted. So it's then another two things that have that point-to-point that, that -point -point connection. We then got a chance to start talking about internal memory and um, this will be the, the first show and tell that I'll do just to give you a sense of what this is like. And so um, I'll pull this up in a second, but just to give you an idea, this is what a, a stick of memory looks like. And so this is a little bit old, relatively speaking to what we have. This is a 256 megabit RAM stick um, from Micron. And so this is uh, the type of memory that I had had in some older computers. And the fact that this is larger, um, not today, but in another day, I'll show you what a, a laptop memory module looks like. And it would be about like a quarter of the size. With a, a laptop, the, the, the function the, that you're trying to um, work on the most is making it portable. So size matters, battery powered and, and weight. And so size, weight, and power, um, that's actually so common in, in some of the things that I've worked with. There's a term that's called swap, space, weight, size, weight, and power. So taking like the, the first letter for each one of those and having a little and so you can turn it into a word, maybe that gives you a sense of what I'm talking about here. Well, let me, um, sh I'll just show briefly the, the spec for this memory. I'll share my screen in just a second, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about here. So 
one of the reasons why I'm wanting to to do this is to to show you um, kind of I use this analogy of having us getting the chance to to go into the kitchen if you as you were to see what is actually going on with things. And so this is a um, micron, their, their, their data sheets. And I <clears throat> didn't have a chance to authenticate if this was the one that I was showing you, but it was definitely the 256 megabits. And you can see how they, they do it as they have these banking organizations of chips. And um, I know with me sharing that, it might be a little bit harder to see my screen. But you can see that there's like multiple chips on this um, this stick. So there's two, four, six, eight, 16 of those chips. And so um, what I think this is, is um, it's one of these 16 um, types of things that are, are used. And so um, you have an aggregate there, but it's basically um, there's an aggregate below that that you could start to, to see what's what's going on. So we heard about um, um, DRAM, dynamic RAM, and then we also talked about SDRAM, the one of the last charts that I was sharing um, from our lecture on Tuesday. I'll see if I can quickly just go to that chart to give you a reminder of what I was referring to there. So I had all these acronyms that I was trying to spell out for you to give you a sense of what we were talking about. Yeah, so synchronous dynamic random access memory, and then there's also this um, double data rate. And I think this memory chip that I'm showing you is actually old enough that it doesn't have that as part of its technology. So it's just this is SDRAM before they got into some of these other things. And I, I think this was a typo that I mentioned. So I'm gonna fix it since I was in full screen mode before and I couldn't catch that. So um, anyway, I'll, I'll double check that a little bit later and I can do that real time. Um, so that was just a, maybe a little bit of context that might be fun for, for you to be thinking about. And then a, another little factoid that I can be sharing is um, if you've never seen what an integrated circuit looks like. So um, I showed you that stick of memory. And these are just some examples of some chips that I've had for a long time. And so I just actually put them on both sides of this. And what this is, is meant to do, it's supposed to be an anti-static material. And so this is like a bag, it looks kind of pink and I have a lot of these little chips in there. Um, transistor, transistor logic, um, 7402, 7404, things like that of, of chips. And so we've been seeing pictures of this or schematics, there are different ways of, of seeing things. And so that's one of the things that I just wanted to, to give a, a little bit of a, a way of letting you see what I'm referring to there. So that's a, a little bit of co more context as we're thinking about the, the memory that we're being exposed to. And um, I'll come back to that a little bit over the next handful of weeks. Um, this is just a, um, I took a picture of that. It might be a little bit easier for you to see this on the, on the screen. So I can actually even zoom in a little bit more. And so you can see how this, these are integrated chips that are, are soldered right to this board. And so this is uh, the thing that I looked up was, I know it's a little bit blurry here, but PC100, that's actually um, giving you some information about its speed. And so um, I think this is the, the, the number for, for that thing. And so there's, there's eight of these chips on this side and on and then there's on the bot the back and you notice how there's these um the, these connections here these are the things that when you stick it into your your back plane this is the thing that you would 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 be sticking it in with and you notice there's a little slot here this that's one of the ways that it's trying to make sure that you don't install it the wrong way and so 
there's like so it's basically if you flipped it you know 180 degrees it would not it not would not work and there's a little thing up here and a little thing down here that usually have like little lock-in mechanisms to keep it so it will, it'll be secure. Um, so that's just a, another thing that if you've never actually seen one of those or thought about that, that's um, something to, to consider. The, the next thing that I wanted to um, have you think about, and so this is with our digital logic simulator. Um, I'd like to, after I just do this, I'll break for a minute and see if anybody would like to share a little bit about their digital um, logic, maybe um, share what the meaning of this is. And the, the textbook I used before stalling Coomer, this is one of the ones that he talked about. And there's a couple things that are seen here. This is not the simplest way of coming up with this type of a, an output. But you also see that there's these interim type of things that are helpful. So actually, you could argue there's three different outputs here. And so that would be yet another way that you could be starting to work on something. Let's say that this logic here was sufficient for what you're trying to do, say, to validate that your garage door is closed, your front door is closed. And so there's a, a way of having this logic that you would want to be having that. And so you can have a nice test point here, even below that, say that you're just trying to sample that your garage door is closed, and then your garage door and your front door, and then you have this aggregation of uh, windows. And so maybe just using a, a security analogy, that would be something that you would, would have. And so digital logic is something that you can add on to fairly easily. And so that's kind of, of nice. Um, another thing I was, I was preparing for today that I, I saw, and so this may not make too much sense to you, but basically um, looking at the GitHub website and what people have posted, there's a couple ways that you can export this, BHDL and Verilog. With this information, you can actually um, send this to a chip manufacturer and they could actually make a custom chip like this little thing that I was showing here um, in that little module. And this capability that you programmed um, would actually be in that chip. So, well, this is pretty basic, but let me just show you something that um, I was finding. And I, I haven't been able to go through this in detail, so I'm not gonna run it, but um, just give you three little pic pictorials of things that I found things that are a lot more complicated than what we have been developing. And um, this is one of the things that, that I found. This is um, trying to emulate a processor in this digital design tool that we have. This is one that I found. And so for today, I'm just giving a table of contents to give you an idea. And then we can talk about this more. Um, this is another one. Um, this was a, another type of emulation of, of a processor. Um, I think I will run this one because I know it works, but I haven't had a chance yet to, to dig into it to really give you a sense that, to say that I really um, know all those details. So this is like turning it on. And so then you could be starting to execute a program. And so it is actually um, loading um, assembly language like um, steps into this processor. And I've just, so far, I've just found a, a few things that I've been able to um, figure out what's going on with, with what they're doing with that, um, that information. So there's that one, and there's also this other emulator. Um, this was kind of nice. It actually gave a little bit of description. And so this is something else that you could be doing in this. It's a simulation of this Altera. DE2115, and this is a FB, FPGA, and this is a some field programmable gate array. And so literally you could create your, your um, huge superset. You know, I was showing you this, this simple circuit before, um, and you can, you can get as, as elaborate as you might want um, to, to something like what I was just showing you. 
So you can see that there is some linkage going between one of these projects and the other things that we're, we're doing. And so um, keep that in mind. So I think what I'll do is I'll pause for a minute to see if there's any questions. Um, I know that's a lot of information, but um, I'm trying to give you a broader exposure to a variety of things that end up falling into the realm of computer architecture and organization. Well, let me invite um, if anybody would like to, um, as a minimum, share about your digital logic that you're working on. And if, if you would like to share your screen, um, you can feel free to, to do that. This is this is informal. I'm just trying to get some group participation to so people can see what other folks are, are, are envisioning that they'd like to be doing with what we're talking about. I can go first. Okay, go ahead, David. All right, so let me just see if this is working. Can you guys see all clearly? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm just I just went over like a little tutorial of how this works, but what I was thinking was for the my project is to build like a laser alarm system. So if you walk past by the red laser, an alarm will start going off. Mm -hmm. But I was kind of having trouble, so I looked up kind of like uh, references, and I found this one, but it doesn't really have any AND gates, and I was kind of curious as to, is this a good kind of reference to get started with, but to make sure that it works with the digital logic? Yeah, well, let's just um, pause for a minute to, you know, this is the first time I'm seeing this circuit, so I'll, I'll, I may not grasp it fully, but right, you, you can see that this is a... Con th this is um, you have like an op amp that's at the little triangle thing. Mm -hmm. You have those um, those um, arrows with um, lines coming out. Those are what are that's the the sign for an LED um, for a diode. And the fact that it's got those arrows, usually the way I have experienced that that is an LED that may or may not be be the case. Okay. You have a couple transistors. Um, it looks like they might be some resistors, um, R2, R1. So those are definitely resistors that are there. And so this is an analog circuit that you're seeing in terms of an implementation. And so there is some logic with those two transistors that are on the right. And then those, um, those lines, those four lines on the very far right, what that is indicating, that is the, the schematic way of representing a battery in case people hadn't figured that out. Okay. Um, there's a buzzer. So this would be something that you could be playing with this kind of um, uh, thing with your Arduino kit, if, if that's something that you felt um, encouraged and you wanted to try and do that. Yeah, so a little bit bigger, I can see that they are LEDs. And so it's just giving you some sample sampling so you can get some positive feedback of, of things. I don't know if one of those is trying to to represent the um, the diode and the the the, the laser or or not. So um, I believe the the ones on the the right may have something to do with the the logic about whether it's interrupted or not. One of these things would have to be. Um, something that's trying to to capture that. So let's go back to your digital logic for for a minute. And I know that may seem complicated, but this is where I'm trying to have you it, with your proposal, I wanted people to come up with a concept. And part of the the design challenge is then trying to figure out how to implement that in hardware or software. And we're getting a chance to do a little bit of both in this course. And so um, let's figure this out. So um, what are you trying to represent with um, point A and point B? Uh, I would like point A to be like the primary where I know that the function of the laser is working. And then point B, which of course I'll add more later to it, but point B is like the testing part. So I want point A to be the main one that works, but part B is like the one where it's the testing part to make sure that all the functions are working. 
So just to remind people in the, in the class, if they didn't pick this up, the, the gate that he's using is something called an exclusive war. That's one we haven't talked about as in much detail. But what that actually does, it means that either if point A is true or point B is true, then you get a positive output. If they're both zero or false or both true or one, then you won't get any output. So this is a way of having um, uh, a mechanism that you're actually testing one point or another, but not both. And I think that's the, the strategy why you're using that, David. So that, yeah. that makes sense. And so basically, if you get that true, you get your end goal, which end, I don't know if your end goal means that it's um, like that will be one that uh, alarms. So I just kind of put end goals to like where it's actually going to start going off. OK, so what that means is that if um, that that laser is interrupted. And so yeah. here we're getting a chance to see how we're coding in hardware, which may be a concept, at least for the, the computer science folks that aren't that familiar with with the engineers, you probably have an idea of how that would, would work. So you're basically using some, some logic and, um, and lay that out into your, your diagram. So I think this looks good. This is a kind of high level abstraction I wanted people to be thinking about. I'm not gonna try and have people figure what, out what op amps are and, and stuff like that, but um, I can continue to work with you and others if they, they get some information that they would like me to help you to unpack. But I think this looks like a good start, David. And so this is something that you could continue to, to build upon. And you can be thinking about what you might want, where you might want to go with your logic after that. OK. So any other comments or questions um, anyone else would like to share what they have so far? If anybody has challenges with audio, I also have the chat, so you can feel free to include your comments or thoughts there as well. Okay, just to show of hands, um, how many people have started your digital logic? Um, either you just you can put a thumbs up in terms of like, are you having a good time? Is it making sense? Do you need me to fill in any more details? Um, any feedback on that point? Okay, I'm seeing some good thumbs up. So that's what I was hoping to, to as a minimum see. And uh, always like to get a chance to get some feedback from folks where, where you're at. Okay, so I did some introduction. I talked about some, some actual memory. And um, next Thursday, I'll spend a little bit more time going over that. I also got a new hard drive, um, a Seagate Exos um, 18 terabyte hard drive for our home server, since one of our hard drives failed. And what I'm going to do, I'll download the, the data sheets for that. And so I'll look over a little bit more over that Micron data sheets and try and, and give you a little bit better sense to what, what is actually going on there, but just, I at least wanted to give you a heads up on that for, for now. I showed you some examples of what you can be doing with the, the digital logic design, giving you a larger context. Um, and it's really nice to, to see that. You know, I'm sure the, the person that made this tool, um, Neiman, I think is, is I'm not, I think that's how you pronounce his last name. I think he's from Germany. And so it's nice to see a little bit of um, um, other people are picking up and, and taking it and doing some other fun things. There are a variety of tools, but I tried to find something that was would be easily um, used either on a Mac or a PC. And so that definitely is something that fits the bill for, for that. Okay, for the, for the second project, um, I won't focus on as much details um, but just give a little bit of a sense. Um, so has everybody um, tried on their own computer the, the Mars um, emulator, MIPS emulator? You can also just do your thumbs up or any way you'd like to respond. Just give me a, a sense of this. Okay, good. 
did you download the the sample hello world program if you haven't i'd recommend that you do that and so i'll just repeat what i've shown already and um just to give you a sense so the way that you open things you you go to the open folder or i think you can do it with a file open as well since i already opened one it took me to this directory of where i want to go but typically um, um, you have to to start out and um, navigate to the right folder so since i'm running this on a a Mac right now, I go to my hard drive, then go to users, then go to me, and then I created a folder here rather than having to go five or six more subfolders to go to my documents. You can feel free to, to try and do that. And so that's how I got this open. So after you get it open, then the first thing you wanna do is to run this. And as I have expressed already, what this does, this is, um, this is a way that you want to be writing an assembly language. And so you can see that there's a ton more lines of comments than actual text, the actual commands. There are some major sections that you have, um, the dot sec text, the dot global, um, dot data, and dot message. And so you, you can actually have looping. And so you can see this command, it actually, it's going, um, this is, where you actually get the information that you're going to display. And this is a simple program, but just gonna have hello world. And so you have to have a main, you can think of Java that what you, you always have to have a, a main method. You can say that, well, this is something that you have to have. And so your compiler is going to be looking for all of these things. To, and, and so the, all that has to happen before you get to this next step. And so we've actually also have mentioned specific registers. And so for this, um, this MIPS emulator, there's actually 32 registers. And so we're starting to have some, some data that we're populating in here. Um, and that's the, the things that we, we have. And so if I started to do, start to do a single step, you can run this and it will go all the way through but what I was also trying to do was give you a sense of how things go from, from step to step. So the first thing is the code for the syscall to, to print a string. So that's the, the first thing that we are doing. So we're setting things up and four is a syscall for, for printing. So let me see if I go to the help. So if I go to syscalls, you can see here a syscall is a number four is for, for print screen. We have that. We also have a um, another syscall here, um, 10. So if I just scroll down here, 10 is to exit. So I my servers are Linux based. And so what I have to do is um I one of the ways I can do it is I can go in through SSH, secure shell, and then I do um, sudo init0, which is something like this. It's a termination code that is just gonna stop everything that's going on with the, the computer. Um, okay, so those are, this is a relatively simple um, program. So we have two syscalls and in between, we actually load the information. So we have to point to that string where that information is. We do the first syscall, that's, that's gonna do the four. Um, then we load the other syscall, we, we, we finish, and that's all that that's take place. So we have one, two, maybe you could say five lines of code, one, two, three, four, five, six. And so actually here, it's broken up into two parts. And um, we have this, this opportunity to, to see this information in a, in a variety of different ways. And so um, probably the easiest to make sense of if I go to ASCII, you can see how things are, are laid out here. Um, hello world. And you can see it's, we're, we're now into, it's like we're speaking a foreign language, um, maybe giving, 
Chinese, Japanese, or Korean, something like that as an analogy, where it's sufficiently different that you can see that you have to um, think of how it's going to be written in one word at a time. And so that's what it would be like in uh, ASCII. Um, you can also have it in um, hexadecimal addresses. That changes this over here. You can also change it to hexadecimal values. So these are just things that you could um, go from one form to, or another with this emulator. So it's pretty simple. It's two syscalls. We have to point to where this memory location is at. And so that's where we divide this into two smaller steps. This is what the compiler does. And so the first one is, is I, uh, uh, LUI. So if I look up under LUI, LUI, it loads the upper immediate. And we'll get a chance to be talking about what that means um, in more details. But we'll, this is now just trying to let you see this um, once again in a little bit more de um, detail. So load upper immediate, set the higher order 16 bits of um, dollar sign T1 to 16 bits immediate and lower order 16 bits to, to zero. So we can do 16 bit chunks at a time. So that's the first one we see. And then the next one is ORI. ORI, it's a bitwise or immediate. It sets the, the T1, so T1 is, um, we have a register T1 right there. To bitwise or of um, T2 and zero extends 16 bit immediate. So uh, we'll get into that a little bit more detail, but basically this is the, this is how we're getting the information so that when we do this syscall, it's going to um, have everything loaded into the right registers so that the processor can execute what you would like. So let's go ahead and do another single step. So we can see that value has been loaded. Um, this That's the finishing up of this message. And so we get that there. Doing another single step. Now we're ready to do the, the syscall. Everything is ready. We do that. Um, it prints the hello world. Then we need to load the, the syscall to 10 to, to finish cleanly the program. And, um, and now it's ready to execute because everything has been configured. Um, and then we're done. So the, remember that the most basic thing that we talk about programming is this fetch execute, fetch execute. We can see this probably in a detail that you may not have been used to seeing. You fetch everything and then it sticks things into the, the computational engine of the CPU, it executes it. Then you fetch what you're gonna do and then you execute it. You fetch and you execute. That is a, the cycle that we're seeing again and again and again being played out. So, um, feel free to, to start small and simple. You could even um, use this one. Maybe instead of hello world, maybe your first program would be instead of hello world, or you could say, I like um, going to school at APU or whatever you want. You could just have a different message and then you could start to be looking at something else. Um, but for, for today, I, I think I'll just leave it at that. I won't go into um, another example with the, um, the Mars emulator. I'll leave that for the uh, future of Thursday. All right, well, let me stop sharing my screen again for a moment, and I'm going to now transition to the third experiment with the, um, <clears throat> the Arduino. And so over here, it's a little bit small, but I, I was showing you an example with two Arduinos um, what are called nanos. I actually have a third one. And so this actually is not hooked up to anything. It's just the Arduino itself. And so um, I'm going to, to share my screen and show you what it looks like with the IDE that we have available to, um, 
play with with some of this. So let me. So are you seeing, um, hopefully you're seeing this display the, right now. And so what this is, is, let me just get a thumbs up. I see Isabel is saying yes. Any, everybody, you guys seen what I have, what I'm showing yeah, here? It's good. Okay, good. So this is one of these simple programs that you can be loading. And so I'm actually, just to, just to give you a reminder what I'm doing, I'm using Microsoft Remote um, desktop to access my um, Microsoft Surface Pro X. And so this is a, it's a Windows 11 machine, but it's actually an ARM processor, which is one of the reasons why I got it because I wanted to get a chance to, to play with it. And, and about 90% of the times you wouldn't know that it's not an x86 um, processor, but, it, and this is an example where that is um, true. So I have this um, full screen mode for, for the moment. And so if I was to go to file, examples, basic, and then analog read serial, that's the one that I've loaded. So if literally, if you have your Arduino kit, plug in the USB, plug in the, the um, USB cable, hook it up to the Arduino. What you're going to have to do when you have that hooked up, you can have to make sure that the right board is selected. It defaults to the Arduino Uno. This is an Arduino Nano, so I have that selected. Um, a lot of times you don't have to play with a processor. And then, um, then you have to select the port. And so it's going to be something like this, a uh, COM6. Now, for me to get this Nano to work with my um, my Surface, I actually had to install a driver. The driver wasn't there, but I have validated that for an Uno, it defaults out of the box. It works for both um, a Mac or a PC, so you shouldn't have any issues with that. Once you have that all configured, you'll be able to do this get board information, and it will pop up with this, and this is one of the ways that you can validate that you have things working. Okay, I have this open. I have my Arduino kit. And so what you want to do is you want to upload it to your Arduino kit, which I did. And so um, let me go ahead in and I don't think I have the plotter open here. So let me go ahead and open up the, the plotter. There's, there's two things that are kind of nice. Um, and I'll show you it in in two ways, I'll show you with the, um, showing this information in a plot, and then it, it'll give you the, the actual values and I'll explain some of what we're seeing. So um, what you have here, you have um, two main sections that come up when you do a, a new script. So I've just do file new. You'll get a, a void setup and a void loop. So that's what we have here. So the void setup is we actually are, we want to be sampling a serial port. And this is the, the data rate in which it's going to sample that. And so, it actually, what it does, it, it um, reads an analog input to pin zero. I don't have anything out there. So basically it's getting noise, but at least is demonstrating that it is working. So um, we want to be reading the input on analog pin one. And so this is the way that we sh share that. And so we define a variable sensor value and it actually is getting that information from this analog read and it's going to A0, that's the, the pin. We don't have to actually load anything to, to make it work. And then we do that print, we print it out. We have a little bit of a delay, uh, but I don't remember off the top of my second, if that's, I think it might be a one microsecond. And so that's what we see here with this display if we were to, to plot it. The other way I can look at this information 
I can go to the serial monitor and there's something called an A to D converter that it just takes that analog information and converts it to a value and prints it. So those are the two ways that I can be showing that information. So um, maybe that'll take a little bit of the mystique of, of working with your, your Arduino kit. Literally, without having anything hooked up, you could start to be doing some stuff and get some confidence about things are, are working just fine. Um, since you do have that wiring board, you can go ahead and clip it in to that because it that's where you would want to be having it anyway when you're going to start to be doing your programming. And so um, if you're having a little bit of challenges with that, bring your kit on Tuesday and we'll get a chance to, to go over that and I can help you um, get that to, to work. Okay, any questions on that? All right, well, give me some feedback, folks. Um, everybody, um, does everybody have your Arduino kit? If you have your Arduino kit, why don't you do a thumbs up? Okay, some of you, but not everybody. Um, please, if you don't have your kit already ordered, get it as soon as possible. Because it's actually these times that we're having a lab, it would be a lot more enjoyable and a better use of your time if you're actually working on it as we speak. Um, just like David had his um, digital emulator up and running, um, he probably got inspired and um, maybe he's now working on some more logic he's going to, to stick in there. So I'd encourage you to be, be doing that, okay? All right, thank you for the update, Kyle. Um, Josiah, great job. Um, I think you're gonna, um, like I said, this is, that'll probably be the most memorable part of this course because <laughs> it, it's it's a nice way of tying it all together, using your hands, um, making things work. And I hope that, that you'll find that it's it's a really neat experience that you'll get a chance to, to try. So, um, Anybody else want to, um, if you don't want to show your digital design, would you like to tell the class what you're working on for your project? Give some, let some other people know what you're working on. Maybe I'll just arbitrarily pick one or two people. Enzo, you want to give a heads up on, on what you're working on? Yeah, for the, the digital design project, right? The digital logic. Yeah, the larger context of your, your project, and then you can get into more details talking about your digital logic. Sure. So I decided to go for like a like a movie kind of theme, like a for the general overarching theme for the three projects. Uh, and then for the digital logic, uh, the gate one, I wrote down that I was gonna try and do like a sort of like a movie recommender kind of thing where it'll ask you like a question, it'll be like, Oh, do you like this? And then you can either say yes or no. And based on your answer, you can like flip a switch or click a button or something. And mm -hmm. then after a series of questions, it'll go through like a series of gates to end up with one specific, like one final answer based on your preferences. Um, and it shouldn't be too difficult. It's basically just a series of gates. Um, the list of movies, you know, predetermined by me, it's not like, you know, random or anything. Um, so basically based on your series of inputs, it'll output one final um, solution. So that was my digital logic. Uh, project idea that I was going to turn in. Yeah, that sounds good, Enzo. Thank you for giving me that feedback. Nathan, why don't you give us a heads up on what you're thinking about doing? I'm still not sure what I'm doing. Um, 
Well, let's just kind of break that down for a minute or two. Um, do you have like your area of interest that you're framing? Do you have you have that kind of laid out what you're thinking you're going to work on, Nathan? Uh, no, I don't. I don't really have any groundwork at all. Okay. Well, um, I recommend that you get onto that as soon as you can. Um, Riley, anything you want to share? Uh, not really. I'm at, I'm actually doing a movie thing as well. With, and uh, funny enough, um, I haven't really. I'm not gonna. Lie, I haven't really started any like the digital logic or anything. I'm yeah, I recommend you. Lazy. Try and do it, especially like in class, because um, uh, I believe it's next Thursday is when it's due. It could be next Friday. Yeah. So um, trying to to not have it be a real cramped at the end of the semester when we're we're doing stuff. So um, yeah, I, I've written down a few ideas like what I want to do. I just haven't actually done it. Okay, that so, sounds good. making a little progress. All right. Well. Um, I'll pause for another minute to see if anybody else has any comments or questions. Um, if not, I'll just begin to start to go into the, the next chapter of material. Um, as for the moment, we're talking about memory. And so we talked about internal memory last time. And so now let's talk about external memory. So um, maybe just to give a little context for me, if it helps, like I told you that I had a hard drive failed. And so, and then I had to reinstall the, the software on um, the server and then put in the new hard drive. And so I was going between internal and external memory. I had like a, um, a external box that you can stick in a hard drive plug it into a USB port and still access the information, which was really helpful for, for what I was trying to, to accomplish. So that's maybe just something to, to me thinking about this. And so um, I had mentioned this term at the very beginning. And so we'll get a chance to start to figure out what rate is. It is something, um, if you're dealing with that things that have um, the, the data is extremely important. So you have a, a, um, a data, um, database that has to be, its integrity has to be maintained at a very high level. One of the ways of doing it is by having multiple independent disks that work together. And there's actually um, seven different ways in which that's been um, identified how to do that. And that stands for a redundant array of independent disks. Um, I was thinking about setting it up on my server, but I ended up not doing that. Um, because if you have two disks that you want them to be the same, I think this is RAID level one, it makes sense for them to be the same size. And so I have a potpourri of different sizes and stuff. So I have like two six terabytes that I could set this up with, and I, I might do that later. But um, my, one of my strategies is I tend to just um, have a lot of the same information on multiple drives to, to make, make up for that. So a magnetic disk, we're, we'll get a chance to be seeing what, what that is, a magnetic read and write mechanisms. Um, these are this like, I think next Thursday, I'll talk a little bit about my hard drive, the, the Seagate hard drive drive that I got, because we'll, now we're getting exposed to what you would have in a magnetic disk. And this new thing that's just starting to come in, the solid state drives. And I was actually surprised when I started to do some research on hard drives. Um, I would I found like a two terabyte solid state hard drive um, um, scan disk for less than fifty dollars, which I was really kind of shocked. Would and glad that that continues to 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 go down. And so there's are two very different mechanisms for a standard hard drive that has magnetic read and write mechanisms and things that are using what we're talking about now. Um, if you were to read the small print for solid state drives, one of the common ways that you'll see is they're, they're um, made from um, NAND gates. 
And then you can have magnetic tapes. If anyone's ever had a cassette tape or reel to reel, or if you maybe have even heard of them, it used to be something called uh, a, um, um, anyway, other renditions of that. And then finally, there's optical memory. Um, I still use this sometimes, but it's getting more uh, and more that it's easier just to, um, to load an ISO, if you've ever heard that term. And so it's, it's one of the ways that you can convert that information. You either can put it on a, a optical disc, or you can actually write it onto a USB um, um, thumb drive. And I've been doing it more like that. And so there, it's pretty easy to find um, routines in, in Linux, but I've also seen it in Windows. And um, there's a, a, a command line way that you can do it with, um, with um, Mac OS as well. So that's what we're just getting a chance to, to be thinking about. So a disk is a circular platter constructing of non-magnetic material called the, the substrate coated with a magnetizable material. And I remember um, when I was first programming like you, and when I was going to, we, they had like a, um, a mainframe computer that we would use. And this is actually a, a mechanism for computing that la endured for quite some time and is still there. Now we, we're more thinking about it and being in the cloud, you get access to resources that are there. Um, they, these platters were like these were huge. And now they've gotten to be a lot smaller. And so what are the, you can have a glass substrate and improves the uniformity of the magnetic surface. There's a significant reduction in overall surface de de defects, ability to support, um, support um, lower fly heights and just some other stuff. And these are the, the kind of things that we'll, we're starting to get a chance to be thinking about here. And so there needs to be some way of having a magnetic read and write. And so with every sector, every location, you need to have a way that you can read or write that information. And this um, cartoon is probably a little bit easier to at least get a sense of what that would be like. Um, so you have an inductive magnetoresistive read head. And so basically as it's passing over, um, if, it's, if you wanna be doing a write, you want to change the polarity. You can see things here, it's north, south, south, north. So this could be like a one, that could be a zero. And this is the way that you can change how things are, are, um, are stored. And so this, these would be like the, the sectors, if you will, parts of the hard drive, but this is like on just one row that you can be starting to think about how you're going to, to do that. So um, a sector would be like this, then you get tracks would be like that, and then you can have a, um, a location on that track. And so this is what you um, can have here is you actually have read heads on the top and the bottom. So, um, some CDs or data CDs, they actually um, it used to, you can get like, um, but before they went to, to Blu-ray discs, you, you can have some that were dual layers and so you'd have to flop over the, the, the disc, say if you have the movie on one side and then you have the special features on the other, it's, it's that kind of thing. And so you have the spindle and you have most, multiple of these platters all stacked up um, like that. And so in a, a data center, like I said, uh, they were huge. Now there have been a movement to, to make them smaller and smaller. And you can see how the, the sector here is larger than what it is down here. And so this is one of the strategies that gets into a, a mechanism of how you're going to be laying out that, that reading that you're going to, to be doing. Um, so I think I'll just finish going through this and I'll probably just finish up with this as an introduction and I'll come back and review this on um, next Tuesday. So here's a, just a comparison of layouts. And so here you can see that you're keeping the, the sectors the same. And here's another one that you're starting to um, try and have it more the same in terms of how what is a real estate for each one of these zones. And um, you can see how there's going to be less zones the closer in that you get 
towards the center of this platter. And so those are some different decisions that, that need to, to be made. Um, and so there are a couple of ways of how that information can be coded. Um, there was a legacy 512 byte sector, and then it's actually gotten to be something larger. And so here you have um, some, some information that are in the beginning. The, the data is in the middle. You have this ECC error correcting code. So we introduced that a little bit when we were talking about random access memory on Tuesday. Well, you have the same thing for, for these hard drives. And that's an example of one of the things that's in the small print that isn't something that you necessarily see when you're thinking about things going on for, for um, hard drives. So that's just a little bit of an introduction to how things are working for the next class of, um, of um, memory. We talked about ra random access memory, um, read-only memory you know, on Tuesday. And now we're getting a chance to be thinking about this, another layer that, that fits into that pyramid that we have um, for everything that we're, we're doing. So um, interesting on this, we will get into thinking about that and then contrasting a hard drive. Um, another way that they view it is something called HDD. And then, the, uh, then you have the solid state um, SSD is the, the new emerging standard that's starting to, to take place. So each has its, its benefits and, and liabilities. And we'll get a chance to be talking a little bit more about that on Tuesday. Any other questions that people have? <laughs>